when I was about uh, two and a half or three years old. I was sitting on the floor with my crayons and a pad scribbling away. And uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. This scribble suddenly turned into a caravan of horses, wagons, dust. I could hear the guys shouting. I could see him coming down the hill, hear the leather creak. It was just unbelievable. Electric moment. And uh, that moment is something that I've tried to recapture ever since then. And I've never quite been able to come that close. That was just a, such a thrilling thing that uh, that's when I decided that I was going to be an artist. After I got out of the Navy and uh, uh, was uh, casting around for something to do, I uh, went up to see one of my friends that was going to art school in Los Angeles. And uh, uh, it just reawakened the whole thing the minute I got in there and smelled the turpentine and, and the charcoal and all that stuff. So I shortly after that started art school, and I wouldn't recommend a university because you have to get involved in all these other things that have nothing to do with with art. And uh, it requires discipline. You've got to work at it every day of your life, and when you're not working at it, you're thinking about it and uh, find and look at the best art available and study it, see how they did it and uh, utilize that and uh, keep working and never give up. The thing about oil is that it has a, a depth that you just can't get any other way. And also there's a texture involved. And, uh, if you blunder in something you can scratch it out and repaint it. It's very flexible medium. So they're, they're two totally different approaches. Uh, but I find uh, for my taste, oil is uh, has more depth to it. My composition uh, arrangements, I, I try to keep fairly simple. And in this case, it's uh, fairly obvious that everything in here is, is leading up to this central girl here, and uh, this is called a prayer to the morning sun. Everything's kind of climaxing in there, and as you get into the background, uh, objects get smaller, and uh, you begin to introduce cooler colors to make the uh, background recede and keep your, your warm colors and most of your texture in the foreground. It, it really is... Uh, not a conscious thing that uh, you're thinking about every aspect of this uh, as it was like it was a formula or something. You're, each painting is different, and uh, sometimes I'll uh, do things intuitively that I I haven't even realized I've done, and they've worked out pretty good. And uh, sometimes they're just total disasters. So. Uh, each painting is a challenge, and you don't really know whether you've succeeded until it attracts somebody enough that they write out a check for it. <laughs> so then you think, well, I, I, I must have uh, done pretty good on that one, because somebody responded to it. I no longer feel that you're cheating if you don't finish everything. <laughs> if I painted all those rocks back there, individually that it, you just wouldn't know what to look at. Uh, and also uh, I got involved in the uh, little swatches of color, sort of impressionistic color that really don't describe anything uh, specific, but when you get back they become uh, foliage and rocks and uh, also the, the softness uh, I f feel gives it some depth that it wouldn't have otherwise. It would have a whole different 
look to it if, if I had finished everything uh, like it's finished in the foreground. Now this is James Bama. He was, uh, when I went to, from art school to New York and got my first job in uh, uh, the large studio, it was called Cooper Studios in New York. James had been there for about a year. And uh, at that time he was just doing fantastic work. Uh, so he's been a hero of mine ever since I first met him. Uh, when I saw what he was doing, it really uh, inspired me to uh, try to do that same thing if the opportunity ever arose. And this is a this is a very fine example of of, of Jim's work, and you can see uh, the detail uh, in here is just absolutely phenomenal. I think he's one of the best realists that I've ever seen. I can stand and look at this painting by the hour. The Cyrus Aftery here I liked because of the uh, uh, total freedom. and, and Just the, the opposite approach to Jim Bama, but it has uh, the same thing in its own way. Uh, and I just, uh, uh, this is also a painting, a little painting I can come in and look at by the hour because it has all these wonderful accidentals going on in there that you can't get any other way than this uh, painterly approach. So I like both approaches and, and uh, when I'm uh, working on one of my paintings, sometimes I'll get this out and set it up next to the board there just to remind me that uh, uh, you don't have to paint every blade of grass. It's uh, uh, sometimes uh, not beneficial. I always feel that these little preliminary things like this have uh, just as much uh, in them of interest as a finished painting does, maybe more so sometimes because they're not noodled or uh, overworked. And if you finish this up, you know, just it would disappear. The charm of it is the fact that it's just a little impression. Now, this is the first painting that I, uh, my wife and I bought. James Bama piece, and then we found out the paintings were actually for sale. And I thought that, you know, when you got that good, you, it was museum stuff. And not, people didn't buy that. It didn't have price tag on it or anything. So that, that was where I missed my big opportunity. I think there was a beautiful piece there for $500 that I could have possibly had. Uh, but I, I really was so ignorant, I didn't know they were for sale. That, it's one of my favorite pieces. I'm very, very, I never had buyer's remorse with that one. I, was, <laughs> I, I cashed in my insurance policy to buy it, and I've never regretted it.